The next topic we're going to be talking about today is uh, cholelithiasis. Now, we just talked about cholecystitis in the last lecture. Now, the story continues. For cholelithiasis, I want you to just realize it's the continuation of the story of cholecystitis and also cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis was a stone. This stone obstructed the cystic duct. We call it cholecystitis when it has when it globalizes in flame. This stone no longer lives here. Somehow, somehow the stone will manage to get through and now it's obstructing the common bile duct. See how I told you from the beginning that everything that has to do with the gallbladder is starts with the anatomy. So there's something special about cholelithiasis. Let's start on history. When the patient comes in, they're gonna come to the ER and they're gonna tell you, Doc, I've been having right upper quadrant pain, also radiating to my scapula. I'm having some epigastric pain. Right? Then you ask them, what else is wrong? They're like, my eyes are yellow. They've got yellow eyes. Now you've got a clue. I got I had a patient last time. He came into the ER exactly like that. Right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain. It's got bilateral scleroicterus, which is basically yellow eyes. I'm looking at the lady. I said, hmm, look at that. You're spilling bilirubin. She's like, why is my eyes yellow? I knew the answer. I knew she's spilling bilirubin. Now let's go over the pathology. If you look at the liver. The liver automatically processes bilirubin, right? Bilirubin has to travel and go inside here. However, when you have a stone obstructing the common bile duct, all the bilirubin start to back up and back up and back up. Oops! He goes into the central vein. When he gets to the central vein, he goes straight into the hepatic vein, which eventually dumps into the IVC. Now here's a catch. First history, right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain. They're nausea, they're vomiting. They tell you their eyes are yellow, right? Yellow eyes. In medicine, we call that sclera icterus. Which is a fancy name for yellow eyes, right? Then you wonder, nausea, vomiting, right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain, and jaundice, right? The reason why they have that, the, the difference, right, between acute cholecystitis and acute cholecholithiasis. This is right upper quadrant pain with no jaundice at all. You know why? Because when you obstruct the cystic duct, you don't spill, you can't even get the bilirubin out, right? However, if you're obstructing the common bile duct, the bilirubin is able to go here, but it has nowhere to go. And all of a sudden it backs up. You ask them, how's your poop? You, yeah, I know. It's clay collared clay colored stool why is this stool clay colored it doesn't have any color what do you think gives your poop that brown whatever color it comes out to be is because of the what is the bilirubin and the bile acids that's what gives the stool color so if you're not able to spill it and go to the duodenum and form the poop all the way out it backs all the way into the back into the uh, peripheral uh, system you still ain't gonna have the nice fancy color. I know, not the really cutest thing, right? You, oh, jeez, so gross. Anyway, but 
guess what's going to eventually happen? Since all of this bilirubin is backing up, backing up, backing up, it's going to your bloodstream. Now the blood, it's got to go through the kidneys. When it gets into the kidneys, we got a problem. It's going to spill out the bilirubin, and now it's going to give your urine dark colored urine. Isn't it funny? When you understand where things are going and how things are ending up, you realize it's not that hard. The jaundice, dark urine, clear color stool. If the bilirubin is so much by salts, cause you to itch. It cause a lot of itching. They might tell you, oh my God, doc. I've been itching a lot. Not cool. Itching, yellow right eye. Right quadrant pain, right? Jaundice, cholidocolithiasis. So, now that you got the history, a physical exam, what are you gonna do? You pop it on the belly, you push down, tell it to take a deep breath. It hurts when I do that. Hmm. You might have Murphy sign, but it's not always there, always remember. But the difference is to know how to make the diagnosis. Now, to make the diagnosis, we need to order labs. So, what labs are we gonna order? First thing you want to get, I want to get liver function test, AST, ALT. You also want to get also GGT and alkaline phosphatase. When you get a positive ALP, elevated alkaline phosphatase, if you haven't watched the video, check back on alkaline phosphatase and liver function test videos that we made. GGT, which is gamma glutamyl transferase, is extremely specific to the what? To the gallbladder, to the biliary tree. Okay? Alkphos, you can find placenta, you can find the bone, okay? But a GGT elevated, it's still is coming from the gallbladder. AST might be elevated and ALT if you get a some mild inflammation. But it's usually not. It's usually coming from ALT and GGT. You can order a CBC to check their white count, right? To see what their white count is. If it's high, it's telling us something wrong. If they have a fever, oh, it's taking us a different pathway, which we're gonna talk about in the next lecture. But let's focus on this. Because one of the complications might lead us to tell us something different from the CBC that we don't really expect. Now, after we order that, and we know definitely this is a gallbladder pathology. How do we make the diagnosis? The diagnosis and the treatment are pretty much the same. Oh, let's do this. Diagnosis E R C P. Right? Endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography right what they do normally how they do this procedure is they'll take a scope that goes all the way into your stomach goes all the way and out makes a u-turn and goes straight into the common bile duct they observe it you'll be able to see the stone and guess what since they see the stone they can pluck it out and pull it out so that's called ERCP plus sphincterectomy. That's the treatment, right? You take a scope, you put it on your throat, it goes all the way down, goes into the duodenum, all the way, makes a U-turn, goes through the sphincter of Audi, see the stone, you pluck it out, and that's it. Voila, I'm done. If that doesn't work, we can do a laparoscopic Cholidocolithotomy. But that's usually done in very select cases. ERCP is usually your mode of treatment. And you're good to go. And the patient feels better and he says, Doc, thank you. Can I go home now? He says, Yeah, good. Now, because there are complications to cholidocolithiasis, 
we need to talk about those complications. And one of the complications is what? Ascending cholangitis. So, ascending cholangitis. Let's talk about that for a second. This is one of the complications for cholangitis. I'm going to tell you a little story. Let's go back to our picture here. Inside your duodenum is a lot of poop, right? Not nah, really the nicest thing. They look nice when you're eating them, though. Until they get digested. And inside there is a lot of bacteria. So, the definition of ascending cholangitis is what? Something is going up, right? Through the steps, right? Affecting the coal, again, biliary tree, right? Coli, biliary, gallbladder. Itis again, inflammation. In this case, what's causing the inflammation is an infection. So, an infectious process creeping up into this green line, which is the common bile duct, is called ascending cholangitis. What do you think is causing it? Bacterial overgrowth. Now, let's talk about the guys that are actually playing a role in this. And I love this story. So, one day, E. coli, Klebsiella, Ella, Ella, A, 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 Proteus, Pseudomonas, Enterococci, uh, they were just hanging out, couple buddies, right? They were just hanging out, right? So I call them the sick PP mnemonic. Cerasia, Enterococcus, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, and Pseudomonas. These are what? Gram-negative bacteria. They were just hanging out in your colon, right? And all of a sudden, they're creeping up and creeping up. And there's a little hole. They're like, man, yo, E. coli, you want to go check that place out? They're like, yeah, I'll go check what's up next, man. E. coli climbs through the little hole, goes up. This is something that's like, fellas, I can't really see, but y'all want to come up here and see stuff? His buddies come with him. They ascended. They climbed the stairs. They all climbed the stairs. Now they end up into what? They get into the biliary tree through this beautiful hole, and now they're having sex. Mating, bacteria overgrowth. Now you've got an infection. So now we know the cause. Let's talk about the history. What is the patient going to present with? We actually have to um, erase this and talk about something very important. Call the chocolates. Try it. Fever. Right upper quadrant pain, jaundice. Now, this doesn't really require a lot of memorization because I told you we talked about cholecholithiasis, and one of the complications of cholecholithiasis if this don't get stuck there long enough. Bacteria can come up there, they're having sex, they're growing. So now, I'm not surprised with the right upper quadrant pain because that's where the, the stone coming from, right? I'm not surprised with the jaundice because we talked about what's causing the jaundice. The only thing I'm not freaking out over, freaking out, is the fever. Because fever, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice, is called the classic triad, usually 50 to 70% of your patients. This is an emergency. I do not want my patients to be jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, and a fever. And that's bad. So, what do we want to do? We want to order labs. When we order labs, another thing before actually we order labs, Charcot's triad is this three, 
we can expand it to Reynolds triad. And I can tell you, if you think Chuckles is bad, Reynolds is even worse. And I'm going to explain exactly why Reynolds is bad. So now the bacteria are having sex and doing that little thing, right? You think that's cool? No, it's not. Because when this bacteria gets into the bloodstream, now you've got a problem. You get into SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, right? You become tachycardic, heart rate greater than 90, right? You get a fever. Now all of a sudden, your white count goes up about more than 12,000. It's not the end of the world. You think that's bad enough? You become tachypnic. You start to hyperventilate. That is really bad. You get warm skin. You go into sepsis. Eventually, bacteria, because we're going to actually talk about sepsis and septic shock. You go into septic shock, right? Systemic vasodilatation. All of a sudden, you get altered mental status. Now, that's called the Reynolds triad, pentad, which is the extreme of a Charcot's triad. Because remember, the fear is because the bacteria are coming in and the neutrophils are trying to infiltrate. And now, once the, the bacteria's uh, context is broken apart, that's what starts to cause the SIRS that I talked about systemic inflammatory response syndrome and eventually people develop ultimate status and they go, oh, wow. right? You don't want that to happen. So, what do you want to do? When we order labs, you're going to see the elevated bilirubin, right? Conjugated bilirubin is going to be high. Just as in cholelithiasis. LFTs, you check what? You check ALP, alkaline phosphatase, it's going to be elevated. GGT is going to be elevated. Do you think they're going to have a white count? Yeah, that's what I was trying to tell you before. The white count, the white count. Why do we order CBC? Because now we see it got a shift, which means neutrophils are coming in. Right? Lab-wise, LFTs. We get alkaline phosphatase and we get a GGT. Conjugated Billy. And if you don't know why we're saying it's conjugated, because the liver already processed it. The UDP, glucuronyl transfers, already added glu glucuronyl as well conjugated your bilirubin, so all of a sudden it becomes water soluble and it's able to come out into the gallbladder. So it's already conjugated. It's not a pro it's not an intrahepatic problem. This is more coming outside here, right? So the conjugatability will be high. We got a white count. We see WBC is going to be elevated. Maybe with like you know increased left shift. A lot of neutrophils. We get a lot of neutrophils. That is badness. Okay, so what do you want to do? How do we treat this patient? You can do how we want to also use the next thing you want to do is get an ultrasound. You ultrasound the belly, the belly is going to also show you the cholelithiasis, ERCP is what we have to do. We have to drain this, right? But before we do that, we still got to order more labs. I want to get a blood culture. Why do I want to get blood culture? I just told you E. coli and his friends are mating. So I want to be able to see them and know exactly what antibiotic I got to give. I'm worried because this guy might go into sepsis and go into shock soon. So we give them IV fluids. Remember, this is an infection. What do we use to treat infection? We give them antibiotics. Now, the most important thing is to do an endoscopic retrograde pancreatal cholangiography, ERCP. What is the point of that? Because the ERCP, like I told you, we're going to put a scope down there, we go all the way into the sphincter of OD, and now we can suck the stone and also suck out all those little dirty stuff. Okay? 
that is extremely important. We decompress this common bowel duct because it's probably already distended. We use a catheter and we do a sphincterotomy. Okay? Also, sometimes they put a T tube in there. So, for drainage, for the, especially a lot of people that don't respond to antibiotics. So, the problem is this is a very serious emergency. Okay? One of the biggest complications of cholidocholithiasis. Keep this in mind and don't forget. Thank you.